just want to, before I welcome everyone, invite you to take this moment to turn off any cell phones, silence any electronic devices, so we can create the beautiful sacred space and honor where we are today. Thank you. Welcome, welcome everyone to the 2019 Multi-Faith Baccalaureate Service at Dartmouth College. The writer and social activist, Bell Hooks, wrote, I want there to be a place in the world where people can engage in one another's differences in a way that is redemptive, full of hope and possibility. Earlier this year, some of these graduating students were among the regulars who sat at the Tucker Center weekly multi-faith conversations, where the discussion focused on identity performance. A guest from the Hopkins Center, Roger Gwenver Smith, distinguished artist, actor, and writer, listened to the students, and at the end of the evening declared, this table is the future of our world. Our graduating students have dug deeply within themselves to understand their identities, and just as deeply engaged with one another's differences in ways that are, as bell hooks imagined, redemptive, full of hope and possibility. They are the global citizens that will sit at the table that is the future of our world. We celebrate the many paths of faith, tradition, and searching that are represented by the individuals and families who are marking a transition this weekend from students to graduates of Dartmouth College. In the spirit of this shared, sacred, holy time and space, we acknowledge our varied spiritual identities, but we must begin with honor and respect to the Abenaki people on whose traditional lands Dartmouth stands and to all Native and Indigenous people here today. In marking the 250th anniversary of Dartmouth, baccalaureate is a particular moment of naming the complex religious roots of this institution which was established to educate and missionize Native and Indigenous people. Dartmouth founder, Reverend Eliezer Wheelock, would not likely have imagined Rollins Chapel as a religious home and spiritual space for students representing faith traditions from across the globe, as well as equally a home for those whose language and lens on life is as questioners, seekers, philosophers, atheists, and ethicists. And yet, similar to the historical baccalaureate, which was a time set aside for students to expound on all they had learned in their academic explorations, we have maintained the tradition of inviting students to articulate some sense of knowledge or insight into the life of the spirit that they have come to understand during their tenure at Dartmouth, each from his or her own experiences, sacred texts, or beliefs. We are also honored to hear the musical voices of the Dartmouth College Gospel Choir, conducted by artistic director Walt Cunningham, and an address by esteemed alum, Jim Kenny. On behalf of the William Jewett Tucker Center, the United Campus Ministers, and Dartmouth College, we rejoice with all who have gathered here. We remember those who are absent, but always present in our hearts. And we celebrate with gratitude that we have reached this sacred time and season. Holy One, may we take these moments of stillness inspiration and contemplation to pause, to offer our blessings and prayers for all of our graduating students as they begin this next redemptive step forward toward building a world full of hope and possibility 
compassion, and peace. I am pleased now to welcome Arvind Suresh, student leader of Shanti, the Hindu Student Association, who will offer the opening chant and reflection, followed by Reverend Kunsu Paul Choi, father of graduating senior Peter Choi, who will share reflections as one parent on behalf of all those who have parented, guided, or mentored a student to this joyfully anticipated moment. Charana Kritam Vak Kayajam Karmajam Vak Shravana Nayanajam Vak Manasam Vak Aparadam Vihitam Avihitam Va Sarva me Takshamasva Shiva Shiva Karuna I began my reflection with a Sanskrit prayer to Lord Shiva, as even before coming to Dartmouth, religion and faith were always a very important part of my life. Attending religious services with my family was a way for us to connect and stay close together while singing hymns allowed us to separate ourselves from our emotions and engage in peaceful meditation. Singing in particular has been a very important part of my identity as I have had a stutter st st ever since I learned how to speak. At times when I grew frustrated with my difficulty in sharing my thoughts with others, Singing religious compositions in front of God gave me the freedom to express myself without judgment and engage in reflection. When I first came to Dartmouth in the fall of 2015, I quickly became lost in the whirlwind of activity during our 10-week terms and lost sight of the picture at hand. I was following through the motions of a student but I rarely ever took the time to reflect on my experiences during my time here and be present in the moment. However, it was through meeting other members of the Hindu community on campus through Shanti that I have been able to stay grounded during my time here. While the past four years have had their fair share of ups and downs, the Hindu community on campus has always been my family always asking me to come to the temple every week during Friday pujas, and always asking me to sing. In sharing my vo voice with others, I have become more confident in being able to challenge myself and take risks while making the most of the last four years. In my time with Shanti, I've also been motivated to think about my place within the larger D Dharmic community and how, through my actions, I can make this place much b b b b b better than when I first arrived on campus four years ago. In finding my niche on campus, I have strived to push my own b b b b boundaries on the path to self-improvement. A large part of this personal growth can be attributed not to my own successes, but to the wonderful mentors, teachers, and peers who have guided and encouraged me to think past my fears and worries. In the following verse from chapter 5 of the B B B B Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna discusses the importance of not letting emotions take control over one's actions, encouraging others to always maintain a clear and calm mind. 
न प्रस्येत प्रियं प्राप्य नोद्विजेत प्राप्य चा प्रियं स्थिर बुद्धिर असमुदाह ब्रह्मविद ब्रह्मनिस्तित According to the Bhagavad Gita, a person who neither rejoices upon achieving something pleasant, nor laments upon obtaining something unpleasant, who is self-intelligent, unbewildered, and devoid of ignorance, is to be understood as already situated in transcendence. For me, the act of singing has allowed me to become more mindful of my emotions, letting all my experiences experiences here help me grow and become a better person rather than concentrating on single t t times of my time here. I share this verse with you not because I have already accomplished this goal, but rather because it is still something that I'm trying to attain every day. As we approach graduation and the end of our time here as undergraduates, it is easy for me to become overwhelmed with lots of different emotions. Happiness and joy from the pr 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 privilege of being a part of this wonderful community. Anxiety for the unknown journey ahead. As well as a tinge of sadness as many of my friends will no longer be just a five minute walk away st st starting next fall. Instead, I continue to focus on how everyone I have met during my time here has encouraged me to become the absolute b b b b b best version of myself. Their impact on me will continue to live on in the journey ahead, and it is this sense of lasting permanence that I hope will always allow me to stay true to myself while remaining calm and st steadfast in facing the unknown. Om. Yeah, I'm Paul Choi, uh, Peter Choi's father. And first of all, I congratulate uh, to all of you who are graduating and advancing to a new career. And uh, you parents who are rejoicing this special moment or event with your son or daughter. As a parent, I know that uh, my life is very much intimate, intimately uh, tied with my children. When they s in their happiness, sorrow, joy, or sadness, successes, or failures. When they feel happy, I feel happy too. When they feel Sad, I feel sad. When they feel they, su they are successful, I feel also successful. And when they fail, I also feel I failed. Like many other parents, I, I believe I sacrifice or give up my life or my time, money, uh, for my children, their education or, or career. Most of you, um, I believe, uh, give up your time, your money, your uh, whatever for your children. So I, I want uh, those students who are attending here to appreciate your father's, your, your mother's sacrifice or giving up. I have four children, um, three, th uh, three sons and one daughter, and I love them very much and they were all born in 1990s, so I support them for the last 10 years very much. <laughs> and and I, uh, they, each one of them uh, is my favorite one. Uh, not only one, but every one of them. So I want them to be successful in their career uh, whatever they are doing, I want to be successful, and I'm very much supportive of them uh, for, the, uh, for them to be successful. Like many of you um, loving your son or daughter, I love my children very much, 
And Peter is one of my children. Uh, he's the third one. And he's a special one to me. Like I said, each one of them is special to me. <laughs> and I want him to be successful uh, in academic career as well as uh, spiritual career, spiritual journey uh, through seeking or, or faith seeking uh, journey of life. Peter, as far as I know, as he has been growing up, I, I'm not quite sure I know him very much now, <laughs> although I, I thought I knew him very well when he was a child, but after he was out of my control, I, <laughs> I, I feel I, I, I do not know him very, very well anymore, and he was far away from home, so I was a little bit concerned about his uh, spiritual or religious life, but uh, I realized I'm aware here Say he was guided and supported by many uh, good spiritual leaders uh, here uh, in the Tucker Center, and, and uh, he attends the Church of Christ, and I met pastors, and they were wonderful, I feel. And uh, Peter, Peter is kind of, um, say, uh, simple-minded, um, <laughs> st straightforward, uh, but a little bit uh, inflexible or stubborn guy. Uh, but I hope he, uh, he will be uh, able to manage his life very well um, in terms of his academic career as well as re religious life. And um, I usually believe that The old saying, uh, people who have a vision shall not perish but prosper. So I want to end up uh, with my reflection uh, with a word of encouragement to all those who are about to start a new career, have a big dream or have a vision so that your dream or vision will be realized uh, throughout your career in your seeking of faith and truth. Thank you. I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, verses 2 through 3. Throughout my time at Dartmouth, I have been on a constant pilgrimage of spiritual growth, a large part of which has been influenced by my involvement in the Episcopal community at the Edge. When I arrived at Dartmouth four years ago, I came hoping to find out all the answers and be complete in my knowledge by the time I graduated. Over the course of the last four years, however, I have come to realize that of the amazing things Dartmouth has given me, all of the answers would not be one of them. In fact, I can now acknowledge that rather than provide me with a prescribed set of answers, my education here and my exploration of faith has instead given me a framework in which to ask questions and explore and reflect on the great mysteries of life. Over spring break, I was fortunate enough to go on a pilgrimage in the UK with an incredible group of students from the edge. We walked St. Cuthbert's Way, a 100-kilometer path that ended on the tidal island of Lindisfarne. Our time there coincided with St. Cuthbert's Day, which we celebrated with the local par parish and enjoyed a sunrise service on the beach. One of the mo most important parts of the pilgrimage and a constant throughout was our daily rule. The daily rule involved an hour of walking in silence after breakfast, the reading of noonday prayer before lunch, community time, Compline, and the great silence. Leading up to the pilgrimage, I had been craving a more consistent spiritual routine 
but struggled to develop one on my own. Fortunately, I was challenged with our daily rule as a member of a community, the hardest part of which for me was the great silence. As a normally chatty and energetic person, remaining in silence from early evening until breakfast was not something that immediately appealed to me. While I struggled with it at the beginning, though, later on during the pilgrimage, I began to really enjoy and cherish the time of silence and reflection. I even found myself looking forward to it. With the supportive community of other pilgrims in the group, I was able to truly feel the value of a routine of reflection, giving myself space to ask the questions that really matter. Because of that, I now have a regular, but also constantly evolving pattern of prayer and contemplation in my life here, which I have found both comforting and immensely helpful in reflecting on those great mysteries of life and how I want to live my life as a graduate of Dartmouth and a Christian going forward. Buddhist teacher Jigar Kongtro Rinpoche has offered teachings about sewa, which refers to the innate softness and openness of our hearts. He writes that when it is warm with tenderness and affection towards others, our heart can give us the most pure and profound happiness that exists and enable us to radiate that happiness to others. This potential for happiness is right here within us. It is not something on the outside for which we need to search and strive. We don't need to get several university degrees or to save up a lot of money to buy it. After leaving high school, I felt disillusioned by the path I found myself on. Though I loved learning and school, I struggled in an environment that encouraged me to seek material rewards or prestige or grades as sources of happiness or an end goal. I still remember the relief I felt the first time I found the Zen group on Dartmouth's campus and the openness I felt from others the freedom to be myself, to interrogate the values around me, or to admit that I was still developing my own. Through the Zen community, I've experienced the importance of Sewa. I feel profoundly grateful for Alan's unshakable cheerfulness and kindness, and the compassion, tolerance, and vicarious joy I have felt from my friends in the group. I will be forever grateful for the warmth they have extended towards me, without expectation to be anyone in particular or to follow a particular path. As I prepare for an uncertain journey ahead, I realize that I do not hold any clear answers or perfect decisions. But I'm inspired by the openness people have shown me, the Zen group, my professors, mentors, or friends, who have all opened their hearts to me at whatever stage I've been in in my journey. In turn, I'm inspired to open myself to have the courage to face my relationships and life fully, to remain receptive to and to learn from whatever experiences may unfold in the future. I would like to end this reflection by sharing this present moment with all of you. When I ring this bell, I ask those of you who would like to join me to be here with me and to think of someone who has opened their heart to you and in turn to feel the warmth of your own heart radiating outwards. to the dark hide away the 
they say is we don't want your broken parts. Learn to be ashamed of all my scars. Run away, they say, with no one to love you as you are. But don't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us. For we are glorious. When the sharp birds want to cut me down, I'm going to send a blood. Drown the mouth. I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, cause here I Another round of bullets in my skin will cast away, cause today I won't let the shame sink in. That was a beautiful and sensational performance. Definitely helped me with my nerves, for sure. <laughs> yeah. In Allah, la yukhayiru ma bi qawmi, hatta yukhayiru ma bi nafsihum. Allah will not change what is in your heart. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in their heart. Reflecting on this text and on my journey in Islam, a common theme that comes to mind is the idea of remembrance. The remembrance of Allah, of the favors he has bestowed upon us. I chose this quote 
because it echoes this theme and reflects something that is important not only to my heart, but that is also important to our current times. The remembrance of our agency, of our individual's responsibility to shape our world, our condition. This is a reminder to myself first, because recognizing my individual responsibility to contribute to the fight for a more just world is something that I recently embraced and I'm still struggling with. As an immigrant to the United States who had never identified himself as neither black nor African, I suddenly found myself trust in a world where I had to navigate my perceived identity as a black man and the stereotypes that came along with it like a packaged deal. While faced with similar aggressions and institutionalized racism as my African-American peers, I was reluctant to join their marches, reasoning that I do not share their generational nor historical burden, and finding comfort in my mom's words who emphasized that I should focus on my studies. I thus stayed on the sidelines, a bookworm, until participating in the Tucker Center's alternative spring break trip on faith, race, and justice. The trip taught me that caring about my struggle is intertwined with caring about that of my peers. Thus, whether really close to home or quite removed, we share a commonality in our condition, and changing it requires our heart to be open to the idea that our individual struggle is that of a collective. That our heartache should be as painful when learning of the, of the lives lost in Pittsburgh as when learning of those lost in Gaza. Because the greatest tragedy is not the unjust departure of these souls, but that their perpetual occurrence leave our hearts dead to the plight of others. In an evolving world, we are ourselves forever changing. I hope that change is not towards a condition of learned helplessness against a status quo that undermines sacred lives, but instead, for a change to be toward a condition of full love and care in which every death report and injustice falls on beating hearts that ache and are moved enough to make a change and remember our own responsibility to prevent the recurrence of similar tragedies. Therefore, I pray that we change what is in our heart so that Allah changes our condition. Amen. Today, I'm going to share a hymn with you from the Sikh Holy Scripture, the Shri Guru Granth Sahib Ji. It was written by our fifth Guru, Guru Arjan Dev Ji, and is composed in Rag Gauri, which asks the reader to strive towards noble goals. Tir kar baso, har jan pyare, sat gur tumre, kaj savare, dusat dut parmesar mare, jan ki paaj rakhi kartare, Badsa saha sab vaskar dine, amrit naam maharas pine, nirpo hoy pajo pagwan, saad sangat milki no dan, saran pare prab antar jami, nanak oat pakri prab swami. Remain steady in the home of your own self, O beloved servant of the Lord. The true Guru shall resolve all of your affairs. The transcendent Lord has struck down the wicked and the evil. The creator has preserved the honor of his servant. 
The kings and emperors are all under the creator's power, and the servant drinks deeply of the sublime essence of the name. Meditate fearlessly on the Lord God, and you will join the Sad Sangat, the company of the holy, where this gift of God's name is given. Nanak, the servant, has entered the sanctuary of God, the inner knower, the searcher of hearts. He grasps the support of God, his Lord and master. I first heard this hymn in high school. I came to Dartmouth as a committed athlete and played four years of varsity field hockey here. But my athletic journey to Dartmouth was long and arduous. After a particularly trying recruitment weekend, one filled with as many heartbreaks as triumphs, I came home from school on a Monday to find a new addition to my bedside table, a frame with this hymn inside. I asked my mom where it came from, and she told me that it was one of her mom's, my nani's, favorite hymns, and that when she came across it that day while I was at school, she said that this hymn gave her peace. It gave her peace that despite all of the uncertainty and fear around recruiting and college for me at the time, that all would be resolved in good time and in my best interest. And of course it did. My being up here and speaking to all of you is a testament to that. And this hymn has been with me through every term and experience since. The frame accompanied me to Hanover during the fall of 2015. And while I've gotten over my freshman overpacking tendencies, this hymn has stayed with me as my phone background. The core tenets of Sikhism are love, justice, and service, tenets which I think are accessible and universal to people of all faith backgrounds and none, simply because of our pure humanity. While the scripture literally talks about living a life in service of God, Sikhism recognizes that all the life in the universe has a piece of God in it by virtue of God creating it. Thus, a life in service of humanity is a life in service of God. While my academic and professional interests have changed throughout my undergraduate career, serving others has always been at the core of my aspirations. Despite the growth, change, and personal evolutions I've experienced at college, these tenets have been a powerful grounding force. At Dartmouth, there are often inexplicable times of uncertainty, difficulty, negativity, and even rejection that make it seem like all of your good intentions and efforts are for naught. For me, it was faith in God Vaheguru, and the reminders in this hymn that got me through those times and will continue to do so beyond my time at the College on the Hill. So regardless of wherever and with whomever you put your, you put your faith and trust, know that showing all of humanity love and compassion, acting in noble ways towards justice and service, and accepting the same care from the world ensures that you will always prevail. I pray that I will be reminded of these truths every day from here on. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. There's a saying that comes from the Jewish text, Pirkei Avot, or Teachings of Our Ancestors, which says, Lo Eilecha Hamachal Ligmor, this loosely translates to, you don't have to finish the task, but that does not mean you are free to ignore it either. This teaching says that we should not shy away from large tasks on account of their size, but rather we should complete them piece by piece. Even if a task is too big to be completed in one sitting, we still need to make progress to get closer to the finish line. This teaching really resonated with me as we approached graduation. Starting at Dartmouth four years ago was a giant endeavor with countless essays and exams. Yet, walking out of my last midterm several weeks ago, I couldn't help but notice how all the little day-to-day -day tasks were culminating in something incredible. Without really thinking about it, the dozens of exams we studied for and the essays we wrote brought us here to the brink of graduation. As I look back, each day was made up of its own personal challenges, and while one day at Dartmouth is minuscule compared to the 1,361 days between the first day of freshman year and today, they are the essence of the Dartmouth experience. As I walked out of that last exam, I truly realized how small amounts of work add up. Any large task can be completed with steady effort, and this wisdom does not stop today. When I look back on how much I grew over the past four years, 
there is no one moment that fundamentally changed me. Rather, it is a collection of little steps that made me the person I am now, and it will be small day-to-day -day decisions that shape who we become. Happy graduation, everybody. I was baptized and confirmed in the Episcopal Church in my final term at Dartmouth. In part of the baptismal covenant, I vowed to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself, and to strive for justice and peace among all people, and respect the dignity of every human being. In high school, I left the Christianity that raised me, in part because I felt I had to choose between being Christian and gay, and I was unwilling to deny a self-evidently good part of myself for a God that didn't feel real. At Dartmouth, people in queer spaces refused to look at me. I only survived the despair and shame of making no friends during my first couple years away from home because of the community in multi-faith spaces at the Tucker Center. By welcoming me in and exposing me to different worldviews, Tucker taught me how to hear people I disagree with. Right now, what I'm most proud of from my time in college are the secure friendships I have built with conservatives on the understanding that we often disagree not because they're malicious, but because they tell a different story about how the world works. The Episcopal Campus Ministry, where all are welcome, no exceptions, showed me that there is a way forward for me in Christianity, despite my orientation and my comfort with doubt. Christian liturgy tells a story about my life, that human lives are of non-negotiable worth, that I intentionally and unintentionally inflict suffering on others, and that I have a community that supports me while also pushing me to be better. I committed to return to Christianity while on pilgrimage this spring with Guy and five peers, and I will spend the rest of my life working to imitate the goodwill they have shown me and each other. In calling us to take care of each other and to love our neighbors and to strive for justice, peace, and dignity among all people, Christianity at its best pairs a truthful story about values with the institutional structure needed to put those values into action. We cannot solve social problems like isolation and polarization without a shared framework that draws people together on the basis of a shared purpose, rather than tearing them apart by idolizing divisive group identities. I worry about not knowing what work I want to do in the future, and I'm really scared that I won't find someone to marry given how badly queer people have treated me on average. Through baptism, I decided to defy those fears and to have hope because I found love and connection when people I never would have expected to care gave me a chance. Peace. Somewhere behind that cross you wear 
You're afraid when you look at me That ain't real love Not the kind from above There's a friend of mine Country tis a peace. God help us to love the way that you love me. Oh, God, God help, help us, us to love the way that you love me. This world is weeping, hurting, broken, and begging for change. Watching, praying, dying, till things stay the same. When will we see, till everyone's free, there'll never be peace between you and me. God, your love is the cure for the rich and the poor. God, please. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Lively, Interim Dean of the College. Even as we celebrate our graduates' achievements this weekend, we recognize and remember those we have lost. Please join me in a moment of silence in honor of Joshua L. Monet, class of 2019, who is no longer with us. Our hearts are with his friends and family and with everyone 
who has experienced a loss this year. This weekend is a turning point for all of us, graduates, families, and friends. I can't think of a program this weekend that will come together as beautifully, as divinely, and as magical as this one. When you take the individual testaments of students, parents, these beautiful music selections, it reminds us that even in an academic environment like this one, where students and faculty alike are taught to look for differences, sometimes the hardest and most powerful thing that we can find are our similarities and the common humanity that ties us together so that we can truly be seen to actually say in places like this, this is me, and that we can find the power to love more. As we contemplate what this turning point means and anticipate the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead, we are fortunate that Jim Kinney, Dartmouth class of 1969, is with us to offer reflection and inspiration. In addition to sharing with you today, Jim is celebrating his 50th reunion with over 369s and their families this weekend. Imagine, seniors, that you will be here 50 years from now, in 2069, sharing your stories. What will they be? You can't even imagine. You also might not be able to remember, but I won't go there. I expect that Jim will tell you that he could never have imagined the paths that he would follow when he left the Hanover Plain. They led him to serve as a founding trustee and global director of the Parliament of the World's Religions from 1996 to 2002. And from 2003 to 2016, he served as co-editor of Interreligious Insight, a journal of dialogue and engagement published by the World's Congress of Faiths. He served as the executive director of the Interreligious Engagement Project and as project coordinator for the International Interreligious Peace Council. You may be interested and surprised to know that Jim never took a religion course at Dartmouth. After he graduated, he taught high school Russian back home in Colorado. He did his doctoral work in the history and literature of religions in Northwestern, at Northwestern in the mid-1970s, and in that time frame, co-founded a nonprofit called Common Ground to offer adult educational programs for seekers with broad horizons. He has also worked closely with other organizations to make the world a better place from the Abraham Path Initiative, which promotes walking in the Middle East as a tool for deepening understanding across cultures and boosting regional economic development, to the Spiritual Alliance to Stop Intimate Violence. In 2010, Jim wrote a book called Thriving in the Cross Current, Clarity and Hope in a Time of Cultural Sea Change. Irish activist and 1975 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Maureen McGuire, described Jim's work this way. His articulation and affirmation of humanity's growing new consciousness of our interdependence and our cultural evolution from old ways into new values will give hope to the human family. I sincerely hope and realistically expect that he will do the same for us today. Please join me in welcoming Jim Kinney to the podium. Well, I wanna say that I've been introduced before, but never ever like that. So thank you, Catherine. 
And I need to ask you later, how'd you find out all that stuff? <laughs> um, Dr. King used to say, yes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That powerful notion became a favorite of President Barack Obama's, and he turned to it often in his campaigns uh, and his presidency. But as both men knew, the observation was originally made by the great transcendentalist and, and Unitarian theologian, Theodore Parker, way back about 1853. Uh, just down the road, it was at Harvard. Uh, and he wrote, Predicting the ultimate success of the movement to end slavery, Theodore Parker wrote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but a little ways, and I cannot calculate the curve or complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I can see, I'm sure it bends toward justice. But you see, to suggest that, that the universe has an arc, the moral universe, is to suggest that there's such a thing as cultural evolution. That's a very controversial idea and one that I subscribe to fully. That over time, our dominant, uh, excuse me, our dominant values come to reflect our evolving understanding of the world and our place in it. In other words, that our dominant cultural values move toward a closer fit with what we might call reality. And I call those, uh, sometimes this happens, by the way, at a gradual rate, and sometimes it happens uh, with dramatic acceleration, and I call those periods of dramatically accelerated cultural value shift, I call them sea changes. And believe it or not, I believe very strongly that we're right in the middle of one right now. All indications to the contrary. In our brief time together today, I'll be able to offer you only the roughest sketch of that complex dynamic, but I hope you find it just a little bit uplifting in this very troubling time. And I add that last thought just in case as I go along you think that I haven't noticed. <laughs> to begin, I'm going to ask you to visualize two crossing waves of cultural influence. Each one is a complex of values, of habits of thought, predispositions. Each one is a weave of models for understanding, of visions of the future, and of fears and hopes and dreams. Each one, in short, represents a powerful set of cultural values. One is older, one is newer. The first wave, long dominant in Western life and, and therefore profoundly influential throughout the world, now begins to decline in amplitude and persuasive power. And at the same time, a second wave begins to rise, carrying with it many of the most powerful and important values of the older wave, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, as they say, but at the same time, uh, giving voice to a much more powerful expression of a set of countervailing values that are more in harmony with the changing realities and life ways of the 21st century. And this newer wave heralds, I believe, an evolutionary cultural transformation. The newer wave finds expression in a slowly emerging global consensus that is exemplified by inspiring value shifts that I've been privileged to observe firsthand over the past 30 years. And that list includes, to name but, but a few key examples, key patterns, the wider and wider embrace of peace, justice, and ecological sustainability. I want to say those three once again, of peace, justice and ecological sustainability as guiding principles. The growth of the global interreligious and intercultural efforts toward pluralistic dialogue and compassionate service. And I'm really glad to be in a space where there are so many people that will understand what I just said. <laughs> and the new phenomenon of globalization from the bottom up, the ever-growing network of communities, groups, non-governmental organizations, and intergovernmental agencies, and committed individuals who are striving every day to build a better world. It's worth noting, by the way, that bottom-up globalization is often the only real safeguard against some of the excesses of top-down, northern-driven globalization. But it's not all good news, and you certainly already knew that. Picture the point where the two waves cross, one falling, 
one rising, picture the point where they cross, one falling, one rising, where they meet, a disturbance is born. And that critical crossing, as you might well have guessed, uh, is, I'm sorry, I lost my place, and that critical crossing, as you might well have guessed, is happening, I think, right now. But what sort of disturbance are we talking about? Well, the literature of the sea is replete with tales of turbulent whirlpools whose violent spin and powerful suction uh, carry un un unwary and unwitting travelers to their doom. Uh, the most e essential character of such whirlpools lies in the fact that each is born from the convergence of opposing forces. Whirlpools, vortices, and maelstroms are all variations on a single theme the eddy, as a turbulent gyre emerging from the interference of two or more waves or currents or tides, the eddy makes, I think, a very apt metaphor for the anti-evolutionary counterflow. Think about it this way. The tide of cultural evolution may be felt long before the failing older wave has completely subsided. As a consequence, countless eddies emerge, whirlpools of perplexity, powerlessness, and often deep anger. As a temporary but potentially violent pattern of resistance forming at the confluence of the older and the newer waves, the cultural eddy is one, this is an important part, the cultural eddy is one of the most common and one of the most commonly misunderstood uh, dynamics of human social evolution. And I say it's misunderstood because it is so often taken as an evolutionary tendency in its own right, as a harbinger of the future, rather than what it really is, a backlash against the changing present. Now it's easy enough to spot the destructive eddies in our own time. Each is a disordered but forceful reaction against some emergent evolutionary promise. So when patriarchy begins to give way to gender equity, the misogynistic eddy begins to spin. As racism becomes increasingly unacceptable, white supremacy rises for a time. As more and more of us open our eyes to the peril faced by our planet and all life, the deniers grow more unreasoning and more vitriolic. And so it goes. But will the whirlpools of anti-science, anti-feminism, ethno-supremacy, and intolerant exclusivism Will they continue their destructive spin throughout the whole of the 21st century, or do eddies tend to unwind over time? Well, I'm strongly persuaded, you know, I wouldn't have brought it up if I didn't believe, <laughs> that they do tend to dissipate as the evolutionary process unfolds. If we had more time, I'd share more. Suffice it to say that it has a great deal to do with the maturation of the next generation and the rise of the global citizen. And on that note, we might well ask, what would be the best response to the discovery that ours is a time of cultural evolutionary sea change, uh, a time of good news instead of fake news? The short answer, if you're thinking it just might happen, if you're thinking that cultural evolution just might be real, and if you're thinking that ours just might be that critical time, then the best response is to start thinking like a global citizen. Global citizens are cosmopolitans. Their world-centric outlook is a powerful antidote to the familiar variations of egocentrism. World-centrism versus egocentrism. And what are the familiar variations? They're nationalism, racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, denialism, and intolerance in general. The true cosmopolitan is not a moral relativist, but one who understands that plural truths are possible. The global citizen is the cosmopolitan first and the patriot after, and that can make it very difficult. Understanding that true citizenship in one's own country or culture is not possible outside the context of full commitment to the planetary community, a globalist serves both. And the emerging global consensus of values is the core text of global citizenship. 
In a sense, this younger wave, and it's younger in both senses, this younger wave represents a new global order of a different sort, a globalization from the bottom up, a transition evident in a developing worldwide convergence of values with a central focus and a central pulse. And we can discern its animating presence in each of the developments that I've noted. It is essentially the long, steady shift from ethnocentrism to world centrism. Each gradually failing cultural dynamic of the older wave, sexism, racism, intolerance, exclusivism, injustice, imperialism, eco abuse, and homophobia, each one manifests the essential blindness of every self centered value. The conviction that one's own group, gender, race, class, nation, religion, or species is inherently somehow superior to every other. And every day, new global citizens, actually of every age and every culture, are saying no. But make no mistake, the values of the declining wave still possess tremendous influence and command powerful institutional infrastructures. But their radical disconnect with changing human and planetary values and realities means, uh, becomes more and more apparent every day. Perhaps the clearest mark of the steady progress of cultural evolution can be discerned in the reaction of the true global citizen to the presence of cultural, religious, social, and political egomania. The unapologetic hater, the racist, the sexist, the homophobe, the eco-predator, the war hawk, the cultural despoiler, and the smug despiser of the spiritual, every day this hater becomes more of an anomaly and an embarrassment to those who realize that they live in an age of transition and convergence. And so the great Irish poet, Seamus Haney, Magnificent man. Um, pen some verses that could serve as an anthem for the young global citizen and the older global citizen as well. I'll close with this short excerpt from his 1990 uh, work, The Cure at Troy. Look it up, it's a fabulous poem. Human beings suffer, they torture one another, they get hurt and they get hard and no poem or play or song can fully right a wrong inflicted and endured. So history says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a, a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a farther shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. Thank you. Good afternoon. So we'll try this again. I'm, I'm from a tradition where you talk back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we, um, as we do this last selection, I, I first of all want to encourage uh, audience participation. I know that oftentimes in many of your traditions that's considered not proper, but um, we're going to ask that you engage and humor us and you get involved with us by clapping on beats two and four. Uh, and um, if you so desire to stand up and rock back and forth with us, we also encourage you to do so. My congratulations to the class of 2019. I've had the opportunity to, to work with many of you, and I wish you well. I pray Godspeed. As we chose these three selections, 
This is me was chosen, first of all, to let you know that you are not flawed. You are not bruised. You're not damaged goods. For God has created you wonderfully unique for you to fulfill only a mission that you can fill. And that if you go forward in the spirit of our second selection was help us to love. If you move forward loving, embracing, then you can do what this last selection says and know that the best is yet to come. So I wish you well, class of 2019. Know that you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> the best is yet to come. Yeah. Clap your hands, y'all. Clap your hands. Yeah. Yeah, rock with us, rock with us. If you want to get up, you can. I won't be mad. It's all right. Hold on, my brother. You ready to go? Hold on, my brother. Don't give up. Hold on, my sister. Hold on, my sister. Just look up. There is a master plan in store for you. If you just make it. God, God's going to blow your mind. Yes, he will. The best. The best is what is yet to come. To come. Oh. The best is yet to come. Today is the first day. Today is the first day of the best days of your life. Come on, y'all. Do you believe it? Today is the what? You can stand up if you want to. Whoa! Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Today is the first day of the best days of your life. The best. The best. Uh huh. Uh huh. Is yet. Is yet. To come. To come. The best. Uh huh. Yo, I think they're getting it. Now what we're going to say here is, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's all we're going to say. And if you want to join us in solidarity and get up and stop looking at me like I'm crazy, I'm okay with that. Come on, y'all. You ain't. You ain't. No, you ain't. Seen nothing. No. You ain't seen nothing yet. No. You ain't, you ain't seen You ain't seen, you ain't no, you ain't seen, 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 Longer version. Eyes have not seen, nor have you known.
As I listen to these texts that my fellow graduates have shared today, I am reminded of the obligations that we have to ourselves and to others to find solace and transcendence within our own persons or souls or hearts, to find love and to point that love towards our neighbors. Even and most especially as we face times where the constant and eternal state of change reveals itself in moments of transition or pain or discovery, I feel called upon to gather in communion, in celebration and in reflection as we strive for this most sacred goal. This state of connection has always been represented for me by the quote, where you lead, I will follow, anywhere that you tell me to. If you need me to be with you, I will follow where you lead. This is not a religious text. It, this quote from the theme song to my favorite TV show, Gilmore Girls, embodies this mission for me, to center my relationships with my parents, my sisters, my friends. In my time at Dartmouth, this quote has applied to different people and different ideas at different times. Sometimes I would lead and sometimes I would follow. However, what has remained constant is my determination to show up when I am needed, to depend upon the people I love to guide me through times of uncertainty and doubt, and to learn from others as I grow and evolve. As I look out into the new, exciting, and terrifying unknown of my own future, I feel called to trust in those that came before, trust in myself as I follow the path that I have laid out, and trust in the people around me as I both lead and follow with love in my heart. May we all find that love and trust in one another as we continue to grow and change on our journeys forward. <laughs>